Chapter forty five of The Story of Mankind. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of Mankind by Hendrik van Loon. Chapter forty five The English Revolution. How the struggle between the divine right of kings and the less divine but more reasonable right of Parliament, ended disastrously for King Charles I. Caesar, the earliest explorer of northwestern Europe, had crossed the Channel in the year 55 BC, and had conquered England. During four centuries the country then remained a Roman province, but when the barbarians began to threaten Rome, the garrisons were called back from the frontier that they might defend the home country, and Britannia was left without a government and without protection. As soon as this became known among the hungry Saxon tribes of northern Germany, they sailed across the North Sea and made themselves at home in the prosperous island. They founded a number of independent Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, so called after the original invaders, the Angles, or English, and the Saxon invaders. But these small states were forever quarrelling with each other, and no king was strong enough to establish himself as the head of a united country. For more than five hundred years, Mercia and Northumbria and Wessex and Sussex and Kent and East Anglia, or whatever their names, were exposed to attacks from various Scandinavian pirates. Finally, in the eleventh century, England, together with Norway and northern Germany, became part of the large Danish empire of Canute the Great, and the last vestiges of independence disappeared. The Danes, in the course of time, were driven away, but no sooner was England free than it was conquered for the fourth time. The new enemies were the descendants of another tribe of Norsemen, who early in the tenth century had invaded France, and had founded the Duchy of Normandy. William, Duke of Normandy, who for a long time had looked across the water with an envious eye, crossed the channel in October of the year 1066. At the Battle of Hastings, on October the 14th of that year, he destroyed the weak forces of Harold of Wessex, the last of the Anglo-Saxon kings, and established himself as King of England. But neither William nor his successors of the House of Anjou and Plantagenet regarded England as their true home. To them the island was merely a part of their great inheritance on the continent, a sort of colony, inhabited by rather backward people, upon whom they forced their own language and civilization. Gradually, however, the colony of England gained upon the mother country of Normandy. At the same time the kings of France were trying desperately to get rid of the powerful Norman-English neighbours, who were in truth no more than disobedient servants of the French crown. After a century of warfare, the French people, under the leadership of a young girl by the name of Joan of Arc, drove the foreigners from their soil. Joan herself, taken a prisoner at the Battle of Compiègne in the year 1430, and sold by her Burgundian captors to the English soldiers, was burned as a witch. But the English never gained foothold upon the continent, and their kings were at last able to devote all their time to their British possessions. As the feudal nobility of the island had been engaged in one of those strange feuds which were as common in the Middle Ages as measles and smallpox, and as the greater part of the old landed proprietors had been killed during these so-called Wars of the Roses, it was quite easy for the kings to increase their own power. And by the end of the fifteenth century England was a strongly centralized country, ruled by Henry the Seventh of the House of Tudor, whose famous Court of Justice, the Star Chamber of Terrible Memory, suppressed all attempts on the part of the surviving nobles to regain their old influence upon the government of the country with the utmost severity. In the year 1509, Henry the Seventh was succeeded by his son, Henry the Eighth, and from that moment on the history of England gained a new importance, for the country ceased to be a medieval island, and became a modern state. Henry had no deep interest in religion. He gladly used a private disagreement with the Pope about one of his many divorces to declare himself independent of Rome, and make the Church of England the first of those nationalistic churches 
in which the worldly ruler also acts as the spiritual head of his subjects. This peaceful reformation of 1534 not only gave the house of Tudor the support of the English clergy, who for a long time had been exposed to the violent attacks of many Lutheran propagandists, but it also increased the royal power through the confiscation of the former possessions of the monasteries. At the same time it made Henry popular with the merchants and tradespeople, who as the proud and prosperous inhabitants of an island which was separated from the rest of Europe by a wide and deep channel, had a great dislike for everything foreign, and did not want an Italian bishop to rule their honest English souls. In 1547 Henry died. He left the throne to his small son, aged ten. The guardians of the child, favouring the modern Lutheran doctrines, did their best to help the cause of Protestantism. But the boy died before he was sixteen, and was succeeded by his sister Mary, the wife of Philip II of Spain, who burned the bishops of the new national church, and in other ways followed the example of her royal Spanish husband. Fortunately she died in the year 1558, and was succeeded by Elizabeth, the daughter of Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn, the second of his six wives, whom he had decapitated when she no longer pleased him. Elizabeth, who had spent some time in prison, and who had been released only at the request of the Holy Roman Emperor, was a most cordial enemy of everything Catholic and Spanish. She shared her father's indifference in the matter of religion, but she inherited his ability as a very shrewd judge of character, and spent the forty-five years of her reign in strengthening the power of the dynasty, and in increasing the revenue and possessions of her merry islands. In this she was most ably assisted by a number of men who gathered around her throne, and made the Elizabethan age a period of such importance that you ought to study it in detail in one of the special books of which I shall tell you in the bibliography at the end of this volume. Elizabeth, however, did not feel entirely safe upon her throne. She had a rival, and a very dangerous one. Mary, of the house of Stuart, daughter of a French duchess and a Scottish father, widow of King Francis the Second of France, and daughter-in-law of Catherine of Medici, who had organized the murders of St. Bartholomew's Night, was the mother of a little boy, who was afterwards to become the first Stuart King of England. She was an ardent Catholic, and a willing friend to those who were the enemies of Elizabeth. Her own lack of political ability, and the violent methods which she employed to punish her Calvinistic subjects, caused a revolution in Scotland, and forced Mary to take refuge on English territory. For eighteen years she remained in England, plotting for ever and a day against the woman who had given her shelter, and who was at last obliged to follow the advice of her trusted counsellors, to cut off the Scottish Queen's head. The head was duly cut off, in the year 1587, and caused a war with Spain. But the combined navies of England and Holland defeated Philip's invincible armada, as we have already seen, and the blow which had been meant to destroy the power of the two great anti-Catholic leaders was turned into a profitable business adventure. For now, at last, after many years of hesitation, the English, as well as the Dutch, thought it their good right to invade the Indies and America, and avenge the ills which their Protestant brethren had suffered at the hands of the Spaniards. The English had been among the earliest successors of Columbus. British ships, commanded by the Venetian pilot Giovanni Caboto, or Cabot, had been the first to discover and explore the northern American continent in 1496. Labrador and Newfoundland were of little importance as a possible colony, but the banks of Newfoundland offered a rich reward to the English fishing fleet. A year later, in 1497, the same Cabot had explored the coast of Florida. Then had come the busy years of Henry VII and Henry VIII, when there had been no money for foreign explorations, but under Elizabeth, with the country at peace and Mary Stuart in prison, the sailors could leave their harbour without fear for the fate of those whom they left behind. While Elizabeth was still a child, Willoughby had ventured to sail past the North Cape, and one of his captains, Richard Chancellor, pushing further eastward in his quest of a possible road to the Indies, 
had reached Archangel, Russia, where he had established diplomatic and commercial relations with the mysterious rulers of this distant Muscovite empire. During the first years of Elizabeth's rule this voyage had been followed up by many others. Merchant adventurers, working for the benefit of a joint stock company, had laid the foundations of trading companies which in later centuries were to become colonies. Half pirate, half diplomat, willing to stake everything on a single lucky voyage, smugglers of everything that could be loaded into the hold of a vessel, dealers in men and merchandise with equal indifference to everything except their profit, the sailors of Elizabeth had carried the English flag and the fame of their virgin queen to the four corners of the seven seas. Meanwhile William Shakespeare kept Her Majesty amused at home, and the best brains and the best wit of England cooperated with the Queen in her attempt to change the feudal inheritance of Henry the Eighth into a modern national state. In the year 1603 the old lady died at the age of seventy. Her cousin, the great-grandson of her own grandfather Henry the Seventh, and son of Mary Stuart, her rival and enemy, succeeded her as James I. By the grace of God he found himself the ruler of a country which had escaped the fate of its continental rivals. While the European Protestants and Catholics were killing each other, in a hopeless attempt to break the power of their adversaries, and establish the exclusive rule of their own particular creed, England was at peace, and reformed at leisure without going to the extremes of either Luther or Loyola. It gave the island kingdom an enormous advantage in the coming struggle for colonial possessions. It assured England a leadership in international affairs which that country has maintained until the present day. Not even the disastrous adventure with the Stuarts was able to stop this normal development. The Stuarts, who succeeded the Tudors, were foreigners in England. They do not seem to have appreciated or understood this fact. The native house of Tudor could steal a horse, but the foreign stewards were not allowed to look at the bridle without causing great popular disapproval. Old Queen Bess had ruled her domains very much as she pleased. In general, however, she had always followed a policy which meant money in the pocket of the honest, and otherwise, British merchants. Hence the Queen had been always assured of the whole-hearted support of her grateful people and small liberties taken with some of the rights and prerogatives of Parliament were gladly overlooked for the ulterior benefits which were derived from Her Majesty's strong and successful foreign policies. Outwardly King James continued the same policy, but he lacked that personal enthusiasm which had been so very typical of his great predecessor. Foreign commerce continued to be encouraged. The Catholics were not granted any liberties, but when Spain smiled pleasantly upon England, in an effort to establish peaceful relations, James was seen to smile back. The majority of the English people did not like this, but James was their king, and they kept quiet. Soon there were other causes of friction. King James and his son Charles I, who succeeded him in the year 1625, both firmly believed in the principle of their divine right, to administer their realm as they thought fit, without consulting the wishes of their subjects. The idea was not new. The popes, who in more than one way had been the successors of the Roman emperors, or rather of the Roman imperial ideal of a single and undivided state covering the entire known world, had always regarded themselves and had been publicly recognized as the vice-regents of Christ upon earth. No one questioned the right of God to rule the world as he saw fit. As a natural result, few ventured to doubt the right of the divine vice-regent to do the same thing, and to demand the obedience of the masses, because he was the direct representative of the absolute ruler of the universe, and responsible only to Almighty God. When the Lutheran Reformation proved successful, those rights which formerly had been invested in the papacy were taken over by the many European sovereigns who became Protestants. As head of their own national or dynastic churches, they insisted upon being Christ's vice-regents within the limit of their own territory. The people did not question the right of their rulers to take such a step. 
they accepted it, just as we in our own day accept the idea of a representative system, which to us seems the only reasonable and just form of government. It is unfair, therefore, to state that either Lutheranism or Calvinism caused this particular feeling of irritation which greeted King James's oft and loudly repeated assertion of his divine right. There must have been other grounds for the genuine English disbelief in the divine right of kings. The first positive denial of the divine right of sovereigns had been heard in the Netherlands, when the Estates-General abjured their lawful sovereign King Philip II of Spain, in the year 1581. The king, so they said, has broken his contract, and the king, therefore, is dismissed, like any other unfaithful servant. Since then this particular idea of a king's responsibilities towards his subjects had spread among many of the nations who inhabited the shores of the North Sea. They were in a very favourable position, they were rich. The poor people in the heart of Central Europe, at the mercy of their ruler's bodyguard, could not afford to discuss a problem which would at once land them in the deepest dungeon of the nearest castle. But the merchants of Holland and England, who possessed the capital necessary for the maintenance of great armies and navies, who knew how to handle the almighty weapon called credit, had no such fear. They were willing to pit the divine right of their own good money against the divine right of any Habsburg or Bourbon or Stuart. They knew that their guilders and shillings could beat the clumsy feudal armies, which were the only weapons of the king. They dared to act, where others were condemned to suffer in silence, or run the risk of the scaffold. When the Stuarts began to annoy the people of England with their claim that they had a right to do what they pleased, and never mind the responsibility, the English middle classes used the House of Commons as their first line of defence against this abuse of the royal power. The Crown refused to give in, and the King sent Parliament about its own business. Eleven long years Charles I ruled alone. He levied taxes which most people regarded as illegal, and he managed his British kingdom as if it had been his own country estate. He had capable assistance, and we must say that he had the courage of his convictions. Unfortunately, instead of assuring himself of the support of his faithful Scottish subjects, Charles became involved in a quarrel with the Scotch Presbyterians. Much against his will, but forced by his need for ready cash, Charles was at last obliged to call Parliament together once more. It met in April of 1640, and showed an ugly temper. It was dissolved a few weeks later. A new Parliament convened in November. This one was even less pliable than the first one. The members understood that the question of government by divine right or government by Parliament must be fought out for good and all. They attacked the king and his chief councillors, and executed a half a dozen of them. They announced that they would not allow themselves to be dissolved without their own approval. Finally, on December 1st, 1641, they presented to the king a grand remonstrance, which gave a detailed account of the many grievances of the people against their ruler. Charles, hoping to derive some support for his own policy in the country districts, left London in January of 1642. Each side organized an army and prepared for open warfare between the absolute power of the crown and the absolute power of Parliament. During this struggle the most powerful religious element of England, called the Puritans, they were Anglicans who had tried to purify their doctrines to the most absolute limits, came quickly to the front. The regiments of godly men, commanded by Oliver Cromwell, with their iron discipline and their profound confidence in the holiness of their aims, soon became the model for the entire army of the opposition. Twice Charles was defeated. After the Battle of Nasby, in 1645, he fled to Scotland. The Scotch sold him to the English. There followed a period of intrigue and an uprising of the Scotch Presbyterians against the English Puritans. In August of the year 1648, after the three days' battle of Preston Pans, Cromwell made an end to the Second Civil War, and took Edinburgh. 
Meanwhile his soldiers, tired of further talk and wasted hours of religious debate, had decided to act on their own initiative. They removed from Parliament all those who did not agree with their own Puritan views. Thereupon the rump, which was what was left of the old Parliament, accused the king of high treason. The House of Lords refused to sit as a tribunal. A special tribunal was appointed, and it condemned the king to death. On the 30th of January of the year 1649, King Charles walked quietly out of a window of Whitehall on to the scaffold. That day the sovereign people, acting through their chosen representatives, for the first time executed a ruler who had failed to understand his own position in the modern state. The period which followed the death of Charles is usually called after Oliver Cromwell. At first the unofficial dictator of England, he was officially made Lord Protector in the year 1653. He ruled five years. He used this period to continue the policies of Elizabeth. Spain once more became the arch-enemy of England, and war upon the Spaniard was made a national and sacred issue. The commerce of England, and the interests of the traders, were placed before everything else, and the Protestant creed of the strictest nature was rigorously maintained. In maintaining England's position abroad, Cromwell was successful. As a social reformer, however, he failed very badly— the world is made up of a number of people, and they rarely think alike. In the long run, this seems a very wise provision. A government of and by and for one single part of the entire community cannot possibly survive. The Puritans had been a great force for good when they tried to correct the abuse of the royal power. As the absolute rulers of England, they became intolerable. When Cromwell died in 1658, it was an easy matter for the Stuarts to return to their old kingdom. Indeed, they were welcomed as deliverers by the people who had found the yoke of the meek Puritans quite as hard to bear as that of autocratic King Charles. Provided the Stuarts were willing to forget about the divine right of their late and lamented father, and were willing to recognize the superiority of Parliament, the people promised that they would be loyal and faithful subjects. Two generations tried to make a success of this new arrangement, but the Stuarts apparently had not learned their lesson, and were unable to drop their bad habits. Charles the Second, who came back in the year 1660, was an amiable but worthless person. His indolence and his constitutional insistence upon following the easiest course, together with his conspicuous success as a liar, prevented an open outbreak between himself and his people. By the act of uniformity in 1662, he broke the power of the Puritan clergy by banishing all dissenting clergymen from their parishes. By the so-called Conventicle Act of 1664, he tried to prevent the dissenters from attending religious meetings by a threat of deportation to the West Indies. This looked too much like the good old days of divine right— People began to show the old and well-known signs of impatience, and Parliament suddenly experienced difficulty in providing the King with funds. Since he could not get money from an unwilling Parliament, Charles borrowed it secretly from his neighbour and cousin, King Louis of France. He betrayed his Protestant allies in return for two hundred thousand pounds per year, and laughed at the poor simpletons of Parliament." Economic independence suddenly gave the king great faith in his own strength. He had spent many years of exile among his Catholic relations, and he had a secret liking for their religion. Perhaps he could bring England back to Rome. He passed a declaration of indulgence, which suspended the old laws against the Catholics and dissenters. This happened just when Charles's younger brother James was said to have become a Catholic. All this looked suspicious to the man in the street. People began to fear some terrible popish plot. A new spirit of unrest entered the land. Most of the people wanted to prevent another outbreak of civil war. To them royal oppression, and a Catholic king, yea, even divine right, were preferable to a new struggle between members of the same race. 
Others, however, were less lenient. They were the much-feared dissenters, who invariably had the courage of their convictions. They were led by several great noblemen who did not want to see a return of the old days of absolute royal power. For almost ten years these two great parties, the Whigs, the middle-class element, called by this derisive name because in the year 1640 a lot of Scottish Whigamores, or horse-drovers headed by the Presbyterian clergy, had marched to Edinburgh to oppose the king, and the Tories, an epithet originally used against the royal Irish adherents, but now applied to the supporters of the king, opposed each other, but neither wished to bring about a crisis. They allowed Charles to die peacefully in his bed, and permitted the Catholic James the Second to succeed his brother in 1685. But when James, after threatening the country with the terrible foreign invention of a standing army, which was to be commanded by Catholic Frenchmen, issued a second declaration of indulgence in 1688, and ordered it to be read in all Anglican churches, he went just a trifle beyond that line of sensible demarcation which can only be transgressed by the most popular of rulers under very exceptional circumstances. Seven bishops refused to comply with the royal command. They were accused of seditious libel. They were brought before a court. The jury, which pronounced the verdict of not guilty, reaped a rich harvest of popular approval. At this unfortunate moment, James, who in a second marriage had taken to wife Maria of the Catholic house of Modena Est, became the father of a son. This meant that the throne was to go to a Catholic boy, rather than to his older sisters, Mary and Anne, who were Protestants. The man in the street again grew suspicious. Maria of Modena was too old to have children. It was all part of a plot. A strange baby had been brought into the palace by some Jesuit priest, that England might have a Catholic monarch, and so on. It looked as if another civil war would break out. Then seven well-known men, both Whigs and Tories, wrote a letter asking the husband of James's oldest daughter, Mary, William the Third, the Stadtholder, or head of the Dutch Republic, to come to England and deliver the country from its lawful but entirely undesirable sovereign. On the 5th of November of the year 1688, William landed at Torbay. As he did not wish to make a martyr out of his father-in-law, he helped him to escape safely to France. On the 22nd of January of 1689, he summoned Parliament. On the 13th of February of the same year, he and his wife Mary were proclaimed joint sovereigns of England, and the country was saved for the Protestant cause. Parliament, having undertaken to be something more than a mere advisory body to the king, made the best of its opportunities. The old petition of rights of the year 1628 was fished out of a forgotten nook of the archives. A second and more drastic bill of rights demanded that the sovereign of England should belong to the Anglican Church. Furthermore, it stated that the king had no right to suspend the laws or permit certain privileged citizens to disobey certain laws. It stipulated that, without consent of Parliament, no taxes could be levied, and no army could be maintained. Thus, in the year 1689, did England acquire an amount of liberty unknown in any other country of Europe. But it is not only on account of this great liberal measure that the rule of William in England is still remembered. During his lifetime, government by a responsible ministry first developed. No king, of course, can rule alone. He needs a few trusted advisers. The Tudors had their great council, which was composed of nobles and clergy. This body grew too large. It was restricted to the small privy council. In the course of time it became the custom of these councillors to meet the king in a cabinet in the palace hence they were called the Cabinet Council. After a short while they were known as the Cabinet. William, like most English sovereigns before him, had chosen his advisers from among all parties. But with the increased strength of Parliament, he had found it impossible to direct the politics of the country with the help of the Tories, 
while the Whigs had a majority in the House of Commons. Therefore the Tories had been dismissed, and the Cabinet Council had been composed entirely of Whigs. A few years later, when the Whigs lost their power in the House of Commons, the King, for the sake of convenience, was obliged to look for his support among the leading Tories. Until his death in 1702, William was too busy fighting Louis of France to bother much about the government of England. Practically all important affairs had been left to his cabinet council. When William's sister-in-law Anne succeeded him in 1702, this condition of affairs continued. When she died in 1714, and unfortunately not a single one of her seventeen children survived her, the throne went to George I of the House of Hanover, the son of Sophie, granddaughter of James I. This somewhat rustic monarch, who never learned a word of English, was entirely lost in the complicated mazes of England's political arrangements. He left everything to his cabinet council and kept away from their meetings, which bored him, as he did not understand a single sentence. In this way the cabinet got into the habit of ruling England and Scotland, whose Parliament had been joined to that of England in 1707, without bothering the King, who was apt to spend a great deal of his time on the Continent. During the reign of George I and George II, a succession of great Whigs, of whom one, Sir Robert Walpole, held office for twenty-one years, formed the great Cabinet Council of the King. Their leader was finally recognized as the official leader not only of the actual cabinet, but also of the majority party in power in Parliament. The attempts of George the Third to take matters into his own hands, and not to leave the actual business of government to his cabinet, were so disastrous that they were never repeated. And from the earliest years of the eighteenth century on, England enjoyed representative government, with a responsible ministry which conducted the affairs of the land. To be quite true, this government did not represent all classes of society. Less than one man in a dozen had the right to vote. But it was the foundation for the modern representative form of government. In a quiet and orderly fashion, it took the power away from the king, and placed it in the hands of an ever-increasing number of popular representatives. It did not bring the millennium to England, but it saved that country from most of the revolutionary outbreaks which proved so disastrous to the European continent in the 18th and 19th centuries. End of chapter 45, read by Kara Schallenberg on March 5, 2009, in San Diego, California.